Well, thank you, Joy. Good morning. Good morning. No matter who you are or where you may find yourself on life's journey, whether you are a believer, a doubter, or a seeker, you are welcome in this sacred space. And I would have you look to the back of your bulletin for the weekly announcements. I know um, there are a couple of people who have announcements to make, so I'm going to let them start. Good morning. I'm here to talk to you about script this morning. Um, you know, the script committee always tries to make sure that we have the cards that you're interested in. We want to have an, an appealing group of vendors for you to choose from. And so we're taking a look at possibly adding some new ones. Now the first step in that is to make sure we have a market for them. We want to know whether you're interested in purchasing them. So we've put some little short surveys, just a list of possible cards on the tables in Fellowship Hall. If you can take a minute this morning if you're interested in buying script, take a look at those and circle the ones that you might be inclined to buy. And we, we don't know yet whether we can get all these cards, but like we said, this is the first step, is finding out what additional ones you might want. So we'd appreciate it if you take a minute and just circle your choices on that. Thank you. Thank you. And I know uh, it takes a bit of pre-planning when you're thinking about script, but we all have to buy clothes and we all have to buy groceries. And uh, script handles both of those areas. So I would encourage you to, to think ahead and then have your checks ready. And after worship, go over to the script table and purchase those things that you know you're going to be buying over. Maybe not this coming week, but maybe in a week or two or three down the road. Um, also, I want to remind you that our annual meeting is coming up next week after worship. And then, uh, believe it or not, Lent is knocking at our door. And uh, so a week from Wednesday, we are having our Ash Wednesday service, and we're going to start it off with a soup, a very simple soup dinner. Uh, we have invited uh, Northeast UCC to be with us uh, to help celebrate that. Pastor Penny Greer will be uh, co-officiating co with me on that evening. So we will have <clears throat> uh, our, our dinner and then the Ash uh, Wednesday service following that afterward. And uh, so I'd encourage you to come on that. And then on the following Thursday, February 23rd, begins our Lenten study with the book, The Last Week. So if you uh, want to attend that study and yet have not purchased your book, I would encourage you to get that so it will get to you in time so you can read it. And uh, I see we're still looking for some help uh, with Jeanette on our nursery issues. Uh, are there other announcements? It seemed to me like a, I thought Anissa said that she had an announcement to make. Okay. Um, any other announcements then? All right. It's so good to see you all this morning. And uh, I'd invite those who are able to stand. Oh, yes. And turn around and greet each other. I will get into the habit of this. Believe me. The peace of Christ be with you. 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 Aren't they? Yeah. Well, what can I say? They get that way sometimes. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ. The peace of Christ. Peace of Christ be with you. This looks like you've got a new toy. Hey. <laughs> Peace of Christ be with you. I know, I know. I am jealous. I am jealous. My son's the same way. Okay, well, if you will join with me then on our call to worship. Great is the wisdom of the Holy One, powerful and knowing. God gives us the choice to follow and to be faithful. Great is the wisdom of the Holy One, powerful and knowing. God offers fire to warn us and water to quench our thirst. And great is the wisdom of the Holy One, powerful and knowing. God considers us with care and knows our ways. And I remembered 
what that other announcement is. Girl Scout cookie time. <laughs> and so the Girl Scout cookies will be up for sale uh, in Fellowship Hall after worship. So um, I'd invite you now to turn into your hymnal as we sing our first hymn, which is found on page 400. Um, Christ is made the sure foundation. like to also uh, give a welcome to those who are on Facebook following us today and if you do have any prayer requests to be sure and uh, post those up so that they can get up to me by the time we have our prayer. If you will join with me in our invocation prayer, let us pray. Righteous God, in you we find life and liberty, compassion and care, redemption and reconciliation. You make your ways known to us and you recognize your people as we are fully human and made in your image. You come to us and we come to you. Let us meet in this time and place and let us bring our hope and our fears, our joys and our sorrows, our successes and our disappointments, the fullness of this glorious and maddening life toward you, assured that you meet us here. Amen. And you may be seated, and I will invite the Vine Children's Bell Choir to join us. Now, they are going to be playing Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. And you as a congregation are going to be invited to sing on the chorus, okay? And I'll try to remember to prompt you to, to sing out. And no matter what the age, we are all children in God's eyes, are we not?
choir. I appreciate that because I'm told that the song that I'm going to have sung just before I do my reflection is such a downer. So <laughs> we, we're, we're having the upper right now, and then I will give you the downer <laughs> as we progress. <clears throat> Let us come into our time of transform, uh, transformation and a new life prayer. If you will join with me. Holy God, your fire warms our hearts when they grow cold to the pain of the world, shines brightly to illuminate the shadows where we hide from you, and provides fuel to energize us when we grow weary of the work. Revive us again, O oh God. Revive us. Amen. God with us knows the feeling of fatigue, the despair of doing hard things, and the frustrations of the world that has turned from the Holy One. God is faithful to refresh us, renew us, and revive us. And now we have the opportunity to hear uh, special music from Mackenzie Schaefer. It is my honor today to introduce my granddaughter, Kenzie Schaefer. She's going to sing, Who Am I? Not because of what I've done, 
Thank you, Kenzie, for that beautiful number. We're going to have a change of readers today. Anissa Brown is going to actually be reading our scripture for the day. Our scripture reading for today is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 37 in the New International Version. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the offer, altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immortality, immorality, makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago. Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, and do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. This is the scripture for today. May we hear the word of God in it for us.
I'd invite those who are able to stand as we sing our next hymn, 544, If I Have Been the Source of Pain, O God. So how many of you have ever experienced this scenario? You've asked somebody out on a date, and they begin by telling you how flattered they are that you have asked them to go out with you. And they start saying how much fun it sounds like it's going to be to be able to go out on this date with you. All of this is priming you for a yes, I'm going to make this date. Only to hear the but. This is kind of what Jesus is telling his listeners in this morning's scripture. I, you have heard it said. But I tell you. However, Jesus isn't saying no. He is going to take us beyond what had been learned previously. With that but. I say. This morning's scripture is the conclusion of those nine statements on living a blessed life made by Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount. Now, in that second half of last week's gospel reading, Jesus assured his audience that his teachings do not abolish or diminish in any way the, uh, the laws of the words of the prophets who had come before him. Now, this is really an important thing to keep in mind as this morning's text deals with four laws found in the Ten Commandments that God had given to Moses. The first two of them, very specific, thou shalt not murder and thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, the other two are more indirect but they are relating to that of covenanting your neighbor's property. So I really got stumped uh, during the week as I was thinking about this uh, 
message for this morning on what kind of a story can I present that will hook you into today's sermon. Well, I finally came up with one of Jesus' parables as possibly one of the, the better stories to accompany today's scripture text. We know that parable by the name of the unforgiving servant, but I kind of prefer the Passion Translation's subtitle of this parable, Unlimited Forgiveness, as it frames the parable in a more positive mindset. It's a story about a servant named Bill uh, who owed millions of dollars of debt to his king. The king is now calling him in for collection and Bill doesn't have the millions of dollars to pay his debt. So the king forgives Bill his debt after a lot of pleading for mercy by Bill. Now later, Bill comes across a man named Henry. And I put names to these people because it gets too complicated just by using another person, this and that. So Henry owes Bill just a couple of thousand dollars. Nothing compared to the millions that Bill had just been forgiven of. So Henry uh, is pleading now with Bill for some more time so that he can pay off the debt. But Bill's heart is cold and thinking only of himself, refused to forgive Henry's debt and had him thrown into jail until the debt was to be paid in full. Now, upon hearing that lack of compassion and forgiveness of Bill towards those who were indebted to him, the king ordered Bill to be thrown in to prison and tortured until that bill of multiple millions of dollars previously forgiven was paid off. Jesus says the moral of this parable is God will deal harshly with anyone who does not release forgiveness from their heart toward their fellow human. The issue that Jesus is bringing up in this morning's text, murder, adultery, divorce, and oaths, are issues that at their core are about broken relationships. In the act of murder, Jesus understands everybody knows it's wrong to kill, but looks beyond the action and addresses the symptom. Jesus is saying that unresolved anger is what needs to be dealt with, and then the idea of murdering an individual as a solution would not come to mind. If you get rid of the unresolved anger, there's no reason to want to do harm toward that person. There are, are multiple ways to murder. It can be done illegally, one person killing the other, or it can be legalized by states, justifying with the name death penalty as an act of justice on behalf of society, but it's still murder. Murder can also be rationalized through the act of war. Even well-meaning Christians have learned to justify murder committed through war. Have you thought about that? It's in a document called Just War Theory. Meaning that given certain situations, it's okay to wage a war against another country as a way of living with a clearer conscience towards the death caused through war. We don't seem to be as upset about all of the killing when we label it war. We all recognize murder is wrong. And I do have to concede that there is some logic in the just war theory, but only because uh, it exists because we are unwilling to deal with the true illness that leads us to war. 
You can also commit murder without actually physically killing a person. Through false accusations and malicious gossip, you can call a person's character into question to the point that they are losing credibility within their community. We see this often used tool where politics is involved. And I have witnessed parents slowly killing their, child, their child's spirit through belittling and abusive language and behavior towards their child. So multiple ways to commit murder. Jesus lumps adultery and divorce and even, talking, uh, even taking an oath as stemming from this same source as does murder. All are dealing with the core subject of unreconciled re, uh, relationships. It is not just about how we treat others. It is about how we truly see one another. Do we truly live our lives with the belief that we all are made in the image of God? Jesus is saying, uh, uh, let's see. When we hold on to our unresolved anger, are we able to see our true image? Jesus is saying, no, we don't. For when we are living in unresolved anger towards another, we have hampered the possibilities of reconciliation. We have not only stifled a, a relationship with the other person, but in our anger, we do not see in that person the reflection of God. And I think the reason that we do not see the image of God in that person comes because we have in our unresolved emotions lost sight of our own image in God. That the reason why we don't recognize the image of God in the other person is we have not dealt, we have lost through our unresolved anger our own image in God. The associate professor of New Testament at Princeton Theological Seminary, Eric Barato, points out that Jesus raises the stakes saying that Reconciliation is a prerequisite for coming before God at the altar. Now, I don't think we talk much these days about this. But when I was growing up, I had a pastor who spoke about the need to work out any of the unresolved issues that I had against somebody before I came to take communion. And this is what Jesus is talking about, coming to the altar. We have to have these unresolved issues taken care of because how can we expect God to accept our offering if it is made with a heart that is not practicing being in the image of God? What if a broken relationship among neighbors, families, or friends, Professor Barreto asks, are not just social obstacles among us, but a barometer of our relationship to God. What if the averse of murder is not just avoiding killing, but reparative reconciliation? Reparative reconciliation. Relationality in its, uh, is itself a way to draw nearer to the God who calls us to righteousness. The same is true about adultery. In, in the time that Jesus was uh, speaking, adultery was defined as a man having sexual relationships with a married woman. Adultery 
even though it would mar the reputation of the female, was not considered the crime against her. It was considered a crime against the husband. A married woman was considered property of her husband. Thus, the violation in question is that of the man's, of one man's misuse or stealing of another man's property. I know we look at adultery differently today, but that was the mental image at the time. Today, we still suffer due to that patriarchal view that it is the woman's fault for the unwarranted behaviors of the man. Women are supposed to dress in ways that will discourage a man's admiration or advances, where in reality, the actions of the man should be his responsibility, according to Jesus. For Jesus teaches that it is the call of those who gaze, not those upon whom one gazes, to discipline one's mind and desires. Professor Barreto continues to point out, what matters most is not behavior, but relationality. And object Ob let's see, objectifying gaze, the objectifying gaze is an obstacle to authentic community because such a gaze treats the other not as a child of God, a bearer of God's image, but as a mere object. These four topics of this morning are addressing the deeper issue that most of us would prefer not to address. The core issue that Jesus is presenting to us this morning is the invitation into transformative living to recognize that all life is reflective of God. And we benefit as an individual and a society by living into that reflection of who we are through our relationality with one another. Let's not be like the bill, the unmerciful servant who was forgiven his debt and yet was unforgiving towards others, but rather treat others with the reverence of the belonging or the reverence that belongs to a child of God. Today, this morning, this very moment, let us commit ourselves to relating to one another in a way that draws us nearer to God who calls us to right living, to righteousness right living. It's relation between one another and it is in seeing the image of God in each person. And if we have problems seeing that, chances are we have not seen our image very clearly. Amen. Avak is now to take time and enter into the prayers of our people. God of peace, we look especially to you during these times of chaos and turbulence. We have sought you out there and now seek you within. We realize that we have grown in our spiritual lives, letting go of the lower rungs of the ladder in order to go higher. Holy Spirit, these truths we know. You are energy. 
Wherever there is understanding, you are there. Wherever there is love and faith, you are there. You encourage the path of understanding. You encourage the path of love and faith. Teach us to live in such a way that we produce the energy of insight, the energy of love, and the energy of hope. Let us practice the presence of spirit. Loving God, we wish to lift up to you Isabella at this point as she continues to work with her doctors. Help them to help understand what medical conditions that she is dealing with. Hear us as we pray. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. We hold up my brother Scott as he is continuing to deal with the adverse effects of his chemo. Shall we pray? Hear our prayer, O oh God. And let us hold Keisha in prayer as she is dealing with her cancer. Hear our prayer, O oh God. And of Russ and Paula, shall we pray? Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. And let us hold Christy in prayer as she goes in on Tuesday for her back surgery that uh, the surgeons will be guided. Shall we pray? Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Are there other concerns or joys that we are bringing today? Let's start a prayer. Let us hold in our prayers those people who have had their lives devastated by uh, such a powerful earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Shall we hold all of those in prayer? Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. So, friends of Mona, who are having to deal with some medical issues, some dealing with treatment and some dealing with uh, future treatment of, of issues, shall we hold them in prayer? Hear our prayer, O Lord. And let us give thanks for Mona's uh, recovering process. Uh, it was a little shaky there for a while. So let us give thanks. Thanks be to God. Misa. So Michelle has gone into hospice, so hold her and family in this transitional time, shall we pray. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Okay, okay. So, so uh, prayers for Bill, who is in rehab, and that... Uh, <clears throat> he will integrate the, the lessons that can be taught there. Shall we pray? Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Jacob. The joy of this fall spring beginning this week. Of? Of the fall spring we're getting. 
Did you say false spring or false spring? False spring. False spring. Okay, we are rejoicing in the beautiful weather that we are receiving currently. <laughs> Let us give thanks. Thanks be to God. I had to buy two pots of tulips to take to the house because I'm ready for spring. Yes. Let us hold Wendy Mullen's family um, in care as they are adjusting to her to Wendy's passing. Shall we pray? Yeah. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Thank you, Steve. Yes. So I thank you from Mona for uh, this faith community and how we uh, try to care for one another. Let us give rejoicing on that. Thanks be to God. Anissa. Yes, I'd like us to, to thank the uh, people involved. But it, was, it was directed through the youth of our church for the thanks, uh, Thanksgiving, for the Valentine's uh, a dance and, and uh, dessert evening that we had on Friday evening. We had about 40 people there. And it was a great time to just either sit and chat or else, uh, and to eat <laughs> Gertrude's chocolates oh my goodness um and or to get out on the dance floor so thank you for all who participated whether you were helping create that event or whether you were a part of that event um, other prayers of concern or joys let us then finish uh, our prayer as a community by praying the prayer that Jesus taught his followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You are invited to join me on our invitation to the offering as a responsive <laughs> prayer. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 8 through 9, reminds us that the one who plants and the one who waters has a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants, working together. You are God's field, God's building. What a privilege to be God's vessels, and participate in kingdom nurture and care. Let us give generously, knowing that we have given gifts to be used for the building. Amen.
invite those who are able to stand to do so as we sing our response of thanksgiving. Join with me on our closing hymn on, found on page 396, uh, where charity and love prevail. And may you move forward from this gathering with the good news written on your heart, faithfulness embodied in your spirit, and God's wisdom leading your path. In righteousness, grace, and hope, be reconciled. Mm.